There is no name like the name of Jesus. And I wanted to sing this song. It's called What a Beautiful Name because it says so much about who Jesus is and what he has done for us. And I cannot help every time I hear this song and sing it that I just, he's, in, he's before me and I'm singing it to him. So I just want to lift him up today. You were the word at the beginning, one with God, the Lord most high. Your hidden glory in creation, now revealed in you, our Christ. What a beautiful name it is. What a beautiful name it is, the name of Jesus Christ, my King. What a beautiful name it is, nothing compares to this. What a beautiful name it is, the name of Jesus. You didn't want heaven without us. So Jesus, you brought heaven down. My sin was great, your love was greater. What could separate us now? What a wonderful name it is. What a wonderful name it is, the name of Jesus Christ, my King. What a wonderful name it is, and nothing compares to this. What a wonderful name it is, the name of Jesus. What a wonderful name it is, the name Death could not hold you. The veil tore before you. You silenced the boast of sin and grave. The heavens are red. The praise of the ugly. against what a powerful name it is the name of jesus you have no rival you have no equal none forever god you reign yours is the kingdom yours is the glory name it is, what a powerful name it is, the 
Well, that was so powerful, that's going to be a hard act to follow. Now, for our guests and visitors today, we have a little ritual we go through every Sunday. So I'm going to give you the key words to say so that you know whenever I ask. So the first thing I'm going to ask is I'm going to ask who brought their Bibles, and then you're going to hold up your Bibles, and you're going to say the word, word, okay? Next, I'm going to ask people how, how many have their notes. And they're going to raise your notes, and you're going to say notes. And then I'm going to say how many have brought a pen. And then you're going to raise your pen, and you're going to say pen. OK, you got it? Now, I expect a loud rendition of this today. So how many have brought their Bibles? Whoa! How many have got their notes? And how many have a pen? We're going to take God's word, aren't we? And everything that I preach and say from this pulpit, you are going to go home with your notes, and you're going to study it out yourself to ensure that everything that I preach and teach comes directly from God's word. And heaven forbid if I do get off on the wrong trail and begin preaching and teaching things that are not in God's word. That's how some cults get into a problem because they never go home and read and verify. And I expect that if I would get off on that wrong trail, that you would be there to help me to get back where I need to be. That's what the body of Christ is all about. It's not just about one individual, it's about all of us as the body working together to build each other up, to speak truth and love in each other's life to encourage each other as we are going through this walk and through this life. Let's start off this morning by saying, Happy Easter. <laughs> and he is, he is risen. Now we are celebrating one of the most important days for Christians. It's the day that Jesus resurrected from the dead. Jesus didn't die just for no purpose at all. He died very specifically for your sins individually and my sins individually. He didn't just shed a bunch of blood upon the cross just to shed it, but every drop of blood that came from his body was to pay for your sin past, present, and future, and to pray, pay for my sins, past, present, and future. Being God, being omniscient, knowing everything, knowing that every sin that was going to be committed by every individual in the future, every sin that had been committed in the past, and every sin that was being committed at that moment in time, he paid for every one of them. He did a complete work upon the cross. And when he said, it is finished, that's exactly what it was. It was finished. And that was the purpose for his coming to this world. And God validated what his son had done, that he had actually satisfied the payment, the atonement for your sins and my sins through his resurrection. As Christians, we can all agree that Christ was resurrected. I mean, that's why we're here today, right? 
But this morning, and it was already said, I want to focus on the purpose of his death and his resurrection. The importance that has with our own atonement, our own reconciliation, and our own salvation. So what does it take to be saved and have eternal life? Is being good, good enough? This is a very crucial message today. And like many of you, I need from time to time to be reminded that my salvation cannot be earned, that it is a free gift from God. His grace is given when damnation should be experienced. This message is not just important for Christians, but it's vital for non-Christians. Many non-believers will never accept God's free gift of grace because they use their own standard of what it takes to come to God instead of using God's standard. So how you answer this question has eternal life and death implications. Evangelism explosion. Oh, I gotta turn it on just a second. Oh, there we go. Evangelism explosion asks a very important question. If you were to die today and God were to ask you why he should let you into heaven, what would you say? Now, many non-believers and some who claim to be Christians but have not really given themselves to God would give an answer something like the following. Well, I've tried to be a good person. Or, I've tried to live by the golden rule. And I've done some things bad, I, I know that, but, but whenever I, I compare myself against other people, you know, I'm really not so bad. I'm, I'm, matter of fact, I'm, I'm, I'm good. Whatever I do will probably tip the scales in my favor so that I would be able to make it into heaven. There are basically two methods by which people attempt to be saved. Either people attempt to be saved according to God's terms or to their own terms. John 10 and verse 9 says, I am the door. And if anyone enters me, he will be what? And I will go in and out, he will, and will go in and out and find pasture. Christ is saying that there are all kinds of ways that people can think of to be saved and find God. It's kind of like for some of the younger folks, you won't understand this. People who are a little bit older will understand. There used to be a program on called Let's Make a Deal. I think it was Monty Hall, wasn't it, who, who was the, the narrator? And what he would do is he would come up and there would be three curtains there. And he would give them a choice of picking which curtain that they wanted. And behind one curtain might be just something really cool and really neat, but behind another one might be a, a kind of like a gag gift or a joke gift or something that has no real value at all. And depending on which, which curtain you chose, depended on, on what gift that you receive. But praise God, because he leaves nothing to chance. Which door or curtain will lead to eternal life? You know, I hear people say that they think that it's not fair for Christians to believe what the Bible has to say, that Jesus Christ is the only way to God. But I would ask you the question in reverse, which portrays the most kind and compassionate God? One that says, find me if you can, if you're lucky, or the one says, this is exactly how you can know me and find me, experience me, and have a love relationship with me. John 14, 6, Jesus said to him, I am the way. I am the truth and the life. And no one comes to the Father except through me. Now this passage kind of debunks the all roads lead to the same God theory. I mean, 
the theory basically says it doesn't matter who you believe in or what you're striving, who you're striving to know. It could be Buddha, it could be Mohammed, it could be uh, the God of, let's say, the Mormons. It doesn't matter because they all lead to the same God. And if that were true, then what Christ had to say was simply not true. And we're stuck with three different options here. Either he was lying, or he was crazy, or he was telling the truth. Now, most people will not admit to the first two because of the implications. What if this stuff is real, you know? I don't want this to be held against me that I said Jesus was a liar or that he was crazy. But they don't want to accept option number three either. Because once that you acknowledge that truth is a person, it's not a concept, it's not a philosophy, he says, I am the truth. He doesn't say, I know the truth, or I can reveal to you truth. He says, I am the truth. And once you acknowledge that Jesus Christ is truth, now you have a responsibility to do something about that with your own life. You have to make some sort of an adjustment of where you are to adjust yourself to the truth. And just think about it. Even if, if we don't go quite down that road and, and we look at the first two only saying that he's either lying or he's crazy, who would want to follow a crazy man or someone who was lying to find salvation. Logic would tell us that truth is the answer that we're looking for, and truth will lead us to truth. The stakes are high, and we are dealing with issues that will have an impact on the eternal state of our souls. Each of us are born with a sin nature. We are described as dead, disobedient, depraved, and doomed. And it's going to take far more than just a few surface works to clean up the mess. We need a complete overhaul. We need to experience a complete spiritual transformation. That is what is needed and seeing that fact, some try to bring about transformation by good works, and they try to save themselves often by some sort of religious ritual. And understand, I am not talking about religion today. I mean, we can find religion in any place that we go, and we can find people whose life only reflects religion and doesn't reflect what we're wanting to talk about today, and that is an eternal love relationship with Jesus Christ. And it is through Jesus Christ that you and I have access to the Father. They think that if they get baptized, that they'll be saved. Or they think that if they will be saved, they just simply join the church. Now let me just say that neither of those two things are bad. We are commanded to baptize to go and make disciples, to baptize them. And baptism does not save you. We believe in our church, we believe in believer's baptism, that it follows your accepting Jesus Christ. And all baptism then becomes is an outward sign of an evidence of something that has changed on the inside. And joining the church isn't a bad thing. When you join the church, you're basically saying that this is my place. This is where God's called me to. This is, the, this is the local body that I'm going to support with my gifts and with my talents. This, this is the place where I'm going to submit my life to the leadership and that I'm going to give part of who I am back to this congregation, back to this church, so that we can minister to the lost, we can minister to those who are part of this church and part of this body. Neither one of those are bad, but they will not save you. They follow salvation. Both of them do. They don't precede salvation. But in reality, if we look at these things, they're just merely, merely forms of good works. They're religious works. 
And in many ways, religious works are the most subtle and damning of all. Because people get engaged in doing religious activity. And believe me, we all get busy in religious activity from time to time. I'm looking at my schedule and our schedule as a staff, and it's just like every day and every night is jam-packed full of stuff. And is it all necessary? Is it all accomplishing what our purpose is, is to love God and to love those who are neighbors that surround this community? All works, even religious works, comes up short. We cannot do enough to make ourselves acceptable to a holy God. God is holy, and, and any sin is inconsistent with his nature. Furthermore, he cannot ignore it. If you were to have a guest over at your house and you were setting the table, and you noticed upon the plate well, there was some hardened food that was left there from the last time that, that it was used. Would you serve your guests that plate? No. You would take it out, and you would get a clean plate, and you would set a clean plate and put that one back in the dishwasher. Our problem is even more severe than that. Unlike the plate that can be cleaned, the blight of our sin thoroughly is ingrained in our very being. The sin nature that sometimes rules our life, and it should rule our life, but we let it rule our life, is actually ingrained in every fiber of our being. We must be replaced. That's what it means to let the old man die and let the new man now rule in your life and in your soul, your heart, and in your mind. Romans 10, 3, 10 through 12 says, As it is written... There is none righteous, no, not one. There is none who understands. There is none who seeks after God. They have all turned aside, and they have together become unprofitable. There is none who does good, no, not one. Look, the sum total of all of our efforts and good works amounts to a big, fat goose egg. It's zero. It has no value at all. But in reality, when you compare our good works against the standard of who Jesus Christ is, it's not just a zero. It goes into the negative category. In the end, none of us will be able to say, I saved myself. We must all come to Jesus at the same level. We must all come to Jesus in the same way. No matter what your social economic background is, no matter what degrees you might have or how much money you might have in the bank account or your abilities, we must all come in humility acknowledging our need for Christ. Because God knew that we could not earn our way to heaven, he provided another way. In fact, it is the only way. It is not our way, it is his way. Ephesians 2, 8 through 9 says, For by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourself, it is the gift of God, not of works, least anyone could boast. We are told that it is by grace that you've been saved through faith. 
And if this is God's way, then we need to understand the two terms, grace and faith. The word grace comes from the Greek word charis, which means the undeserved favor of God. And basically what that means is that God gives us what we need, not what we deserve. And if you stop to think about it, because we have all sinned, we have all fallen short of the glory of God, none of us can achieve righteousness on our own ability or our own self. None of us can be holy, as God tells us, he's holy, we are to be holy. God demands perfection in our life, and since we cannot achieve that, what we deserve is damnation. But what he gives us is salvation. Romans 6, 23 says, For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. Take and underline that word, wages. When you think about what wages are, that's what you earn. You go to a job, you have an agreement with the employer that you come and you do certain kinds of work, and as a result of your efforts and your labor, you earn money or you earn a wages so that you could take that home and buy beans to put on your table. What this passage of Scripture says is what we have earned because of the sin that is in our life is not just physical death, but it also is eternal death. But it has never been part of God's plan for his creation to suffer this eternal state of death. So he offers us a way out. Not anything but based upon our own merits, but a gift which is based upon the eternal work of God's Son, Jesus Christ. It's worth repeating because this is such a hang-up point with so many people. Remember that this grace from God is not on the basis of our works. If not saved by our works and because of God's righteousness, he cannot and does not intermingle with unrighteousness. We are eternally lost because God cannot simply ignore sin. Listen to what 1 John 1, 5 through 7 says. This is the message which we have heard from him and declare to you that God is light and in him is no darkness at all. If we say that we have fellowship with him and walk in darkness, we lie and do not practice the truth. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another and the blood of Christ, his son, cleanses us from all sin. Here is a pictorial representation of this verse. This passage tells us that God is light, and basically what it is saying, in God there is no sin. God's righteousness, God's light refers to his righteousness and his holiness. And in him there is no darkness, there is no sin. And because God is perfect, and because he demands for us perfection, we cannot, nor will we ever have a relationship with God by the way of our own efforts. God demands complete righteousness on our part. There can be no, nor can there ever have been any sin in our life. Which means if you've ever looked at a person in an unhealthy way, if you've ever taken anything that did not belong to you, if you have ever dealt with any unresolved anger, if you've ever wanted anything that your neighbor owned, or used God's name in vain, or done anything that has not kept the Sabbath holy, guess what? You lose. You have failed to meet the criteria. But because of God's love, for us, he sent his son to die on our behalf. 
And it is on this basis and this basis alone that we can experience the grace of God and his forgiveness. Our holiness, our righteousness, our right to have a relationship with the Father comes not from us, but by way of the shed blood of God's Son, Jesus Christ. We have a relationship with God and access to God because of the righteousness of Christ. Jesus came to this earth to pay the penalty for our sins that we might receive the free grace, gift of grace from God, which is salvation. And this is all done through faith. Whoever you are, if you have received the true salvation of God, you have received it as a free gift of God's grace. Being a saint is more than just wishful thinking. It reminds me of a story of one pastor who had a fellow die in his community, and it fell upon him to do the funeral. And this guy was a notorious sinner. He was unethical in his business practices, immoral in his lifestyle. This guy was just plain old evil. And he had a brother, and he was much better than him. Well, his brother came to the pastor and as he was getting ready to do the eulogy and said, Pastor, I'll pay you $1,000 if from the pulpit you will say that my brother was a saint. The pastor thought about that for a little while, and he said, okay. So he got up and said, this man before me was a dirty, rotten, no-account sinner. He was immoral, he was unethical, and he was one of the worst men that I have ever knew. But next to his brother, he was a saint. <laughs> See, often what we do, don't we? Sometimes we use the wrong standard to determine whether we're good or whether we're not. We compare our lives against the lives of other people. And you know what? You can always find somebody who is worse than you. So when you compare your life against them, you say, see there, I'm not so bad. As a matter of fact, compared to them, I'm good. But when we compare our lives against the right standard, Jesus Christ, who is the standard of God's holiness, we fail miserably. And we need a Savior because we are unable to save ourselves. Finally, we are told that the ch channel through which the grace of God comes to us is faith. But what is this thing called faith? The Greek word for this is the word pistis. And pistis is a very specific word. It's a specific kind of faith, and it is only used when it is referenced to saving faith. Not faith to, like, be healed or be like faith of a mustard seed. This is a very specific kind of faith that only deals with salvation. This is a far greater and is in more depth than what some hold a simple intellectual knowledge. John 3, 16, most of, it know, uh, most of us know this, and for our seniors who are used to having this in the King James, I put it in the old King James, and let's just say that one aloud together. John 3, 16, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Guys, my dad used to say, that whosoever means me. And you know what? That whosoever does mean me. And it does mean you. True biblical faith is more than just simple believing. 
And how many here believe that Abraham Lincoln existed and walked upon this earth? Well, both Lincoln and Christ were historical figures who did walk upon this earth. And let me just tell you, there is a ton of historical documentations out there that will attest that outside the Bible, there are historians who lived during the time of Jesus who wrote about him that attested that he was born, that he walked upon this earth, and that he was crucified. But it takes more than just knowing that. Biblical faith is not just simply knowing about Christ. As a matter of fact, we are told that the demons believe, but they're not saved. True biblical faith is not sentiment either. Many people equate faith with feelings, and feelings are not faith. The basic elements of faith is not knowledge or feelings, but it is trust. Faith begins with knowledge, right? There are certain things that we need to understand about Christ. We need to understand that he was born of a virgin, that he did walk upon the face of this earth, that he was crucified for the redemption of mankind, he was buried, and in three days he was resurrected, and now he sits at the right hand of the Father. But then we must trust in him as the only hope that we have for salvation. Faith begins with knowledge, but cultivates in commitment. And for sure, many of us feel great relief and overjoy when we give our sins to Christ. But the bottom line is that all of this, that we have to trust Christ with our very lives. True faith in Jesus means that we stake our lives on him. We commit ourselves to him as our only hope for salvation. Because you see, without trust, there is no faith. And without faith, there is no grace. And without grace, there is no salvation. So what is the answer to our question? Isn't being good good enough? I suppose it depends upon your definition of good enough. If by good enough you mean good enough to please your friends or your family, well, it may be good enough. But if you mean good enough to get into heaven, then it is not good enough. Being good is not good enough to get anyone into heaven. Everyone gets into heaven only one way, and that's by a personal surrender to Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. It is only as we trust him and we stake our very lives on him that we receive eternal life. Can I ask you just please this morning to bow your heads with me. I think I would be amiss if we talk about salvation, what it takes to get to know Jesus, if I didn't at least give you the opportunity to say, I want to get on that path. You may not completely get where you want to get, but you know what? If you are wanting to find God and to seek Him and to know Him, he will reveal himself to you in a way that you can search and know him and believe him. If you're out of fellowship and out of relationship with God and you want to know him, you want to experience what it means to be redeemed and forgiven, if you want to know what it means to live the abundant life of the, the promises that, that God has given to each of us that we can live not just in an eternal state, but up on this earth as well. 
And there's only one way you're going to get to know God. And that is through Jesus Christ, our Lord. If you would like to know him today, I'm just going to ask everybody to pray with me. Dear Lord, I need you in my life. I have fallen short of your glorious standard of being holy and righteous before you. I now accept what Jesus Christ did upon the cross in forgiving my sins. I confess him as Savior and Lord. Father, now move me from eternal death to eternal life. And I pray these things in your holy name. Amen. If you said that prayer, I'm not going to ask you to come down here in the front, but right in the back is Pastor Don Kamush. Please see him. We don't want to send you out with arming you and giving you the tools so that you can be successful in your Christian walk. And he's got some stuff that he will help you. He will become an accountability person with you if you want him to. He will pray with you and he will call you. He will encourage you and he will walk with you as you are learning how to walk in this life. If you made that commitment today, please don't leave this place without talking to him. Please. Because it's too easy to leave this place and have the enemy tell you that what you experienced wasn't real. To try and convince you that, oh, that's just a bunch of hocus-pocus stuff. But we want you to understand and know what it means to come to Christ and to experience a loving relationship with the Father through Him. Before we do our closing song, this is Robert and Louise last Sunday here at this church. And they have taken a church in Keys, California. It's up north around Modesto. And we want to pray for them and we want to commission them as they are leaving this place to minister to a body that they, uh, God has led them to minister to. You know, these are always one of those bittersweet things, aren't, isn't it, Robert? I mean, we hate to see you go. I know that you have told me you hate to go, but yet there's a sense of excitement because they're following the path that God has set them upon. And you know, we've always said in this place that the, the, the success of a church isn't based upon its seating capacity, it's based upon its sending capacity. And one of the things that's in my heart is for us to be able to take young men and women who want to seek after God to follow him in full-time ministry, to train them, to teach them, and to mentor them, and to prepare them, and then send them out to follow God's lead in ministry, whether it be local area churches or whether it be on the mission field or as an evangelist. But it would be as God would design them and direct them to be. Robert, could I get you and your lovely bride to come on up here? I'd like to ask the pastors to, if they would come forward and uh, the church board, if they would. And I would just ask, if you would, please, just kind of put your hand out and focus up here and be praying for God to use them in a way that touches lives and we see the kingdom of God growing as a result of their ministry. Our Holy Father, we just pray for the Steyers this morning. Thank you, dear Lord, for bringing them to our church, for 
even the short time that it has been, what a blessing they have been to me. And I know that they've been a blessing to others in this church. I pray right now, dear God, that you would just anoint them with your Holy Spirit, that when they set out, dear Lord, and embark on this new adventure, that you would use them in a way that was real, a way that would make a difference in their community. And we pray, dear Lord, that by the power of your name, that you would use them in ministry and keys. And that people, that people there would recognize the mantle of God that's placed upon their shoulders as they minister to those and all of those that God would bring into that church. And we pray that. We pray that this morning by your holy name. We pray by the powerful name of Jesus. Amen. All right, brother. Would you please stand and join us in our closing song this morning?